So uh, I think I'll try to actually not talk so much and leave time for discussion, because what an amazing crowd of folks who are incredibly um, well curated there, Jonathan. Nice job. Uh, so you know, a few years ago at CSTE, uh, I gave a talk about kind of what is, at the time, public health informatics is what um, the title was. And I posited that there's three stages. The first stage was where we focused on tools to be used by public health agencies uh, when, uh, to manage our own, our own data. The second stage was in interactions between public health and healthcare, those connections. How do we tap into uh, clinical data to be used predominantly for surveillance purposes? And there's many of you here who we were shoulder to shoulder with in those early days of looking at uh, what is really big data for healthcare, but we called it syndromic surveillance uh, at the time. So uh, how do we put our finger on the pulse of the health of the community using routinely generated exhaust from healthcare? Um, and uh, that was the second stage I posited. And I said the third stage is going to be where we in public health actually get involved with the design and purpose of clinical information systems. How do we create public health value by aggregating uh, and summing up the every individual encounter and nudging them a little bit towards focusing on the denominator rather than just the numerator of the patient sitting in front of them. And that the aggregate of all of those better decision support, better population health management of all those individual patients within clinical care through the help of information technology can yield public health. So, where this came from, uh, let me just give you a little bit of a personal reflection uh, looking back, was uh, on the days after 9-11 uh, and actually even before, uh, we had been working uh, on the um, bioterrorism surveillance aspects. And it turned out to be really good flu surveillance. Um, but uh, tapping into uh, every you know, emergency room visit in the city and saying, can, the, can we understand patterns of disease in a way, in a more timely way, in a more meaningful way uh, than someone working in an emergency room would be able to see? Uh, and when Mayor Bloomberg came into office and Tom Frieden, uh, who to this day is kind of my, my public health hero, uh, we started to pivot to chronic diseases. And uh, this was a little surprising maybe for someone who'd been a TV guy. We thought that he'd really focus on infectious diseases, but he came in and he had a very, he and the mayor, had a very clear framework. And the framework was, how do we save the most lives? And obviously, regardless of what a public health department's historic trends have been, what kills people today are chronic diseases. And among them, quite significantly, cardiovascular disease. So as we started to generate the evidence base <clears throat> for uh, interventions around smoking, right, reducing smoking in New York City among teens from 14 to 7% in four or five years, reducing smoking in adults from 22 down to 17%. We did that through data uh, and used some of the same systems that we built to track the effectiveness of the Smoke Free Air Act. What happens to sales of nicotine replacement therapy in the weeks following that? When we raise the taxes, what happens in different neighborhoods based on income? Uh, how do we look at um, uh, diversion uh, of tobacco? Uh, and how do we look at the health of neighborhoods? And one of the first things I did within, uh, I signed, you know, shook Tom's hand April of uh, 2002. And by the end of June, we had to spend some $500,000 of leftover money. I mean, you know, familiar with this phenomenon? So we fielded a 10,000 person random digit dial community health survey in those two months. And uh, we now have repeated that annually. Uh, and have neighborhood level estimates of smoking status and conditions and then mash that together uh, with 
uh, data from hospitalizations, uh, from emergency room visits, from mortality, morbidity, communicable diseases, and so forth. And what we found was that even in the city's uh, kind of rich neighborhoods, obviously huge disparities, but even in the city's rich neighborhoods, uh, health care was leaving lives on the table. That we were not realizing the full potential. And this was kind of an aha moment for us was uh, a paper that came out that said that between 1990 and 2000, half of, there was a huge decline in cardiovascular deaths, half of it due to public health and behavioral changes like reduction in smoking rates, and half of it due to health care. And we were like, really? Healthcare matters? <coughs> because the dogma for many years, when I was in school of public health, was that huge decline in deaths, mortality in New York City, all of that happened pre-anything, pre-antibiotics, right? Pre-healthcare, being effective at all. But something happened in the 80s, 90s with statins, and then later on with uh, anti highly active antiretroviral therapy, with higher rates of um, effectiveness of drugs that today are, you know, sell for pennies, that actually mean, meant that healthcare in aggregate could save maybe as many lives as we could save through our kind of bread and butter structural interventions. And so we were like, wow, how do we influence healthcare? And we were so naive. We were so naive, right? And we said, okay, here's what we're gonna do. We're going to tell healthcare providers what matters. Because they're focused on their numerators, they're focused on you know, alleviating suffering, but they're not really understanding. They don't understand, don't you see? They don't understand what they should be doing. And we'll tell Michael Barr, here's what you should be focusing on, right? And there were a few providers out there who said, thank you, right? We're trying to do quality improvement projects all the time, but what to focus on? We don't really have a framework for that. So we created this thing called Take Care New York. And it was 10 things, right? In the city of New York, we're gonna focus on 10 things. Now, you know, one of them is like heart disease. It's nine others. And it's a little bit like, you know, all the thousand guidelines, right? And if it, doctor did, you know, every guideline, they do nothing else. Um, so that didn't work quite as well as we had hoped. It was helpful for us to kind of frame things, uh, but our next crack at this was uh, when I happened to meet an amazing, amazing uh, group, a community health center called the Institute for Urban Family Health, and Neil Kalman, their visionary leader. And he really, you know, they got it, right? Community health centers, they got it. I talked to Jack Geiger years ago, and he told me that when the idea for the community health centers, uh, uh, when he saw that first in action in South Africa, in these huts, right, mud huts in South Africa, they had run charts on the wall. They had their entire denominator for that population, right? And that was the vision of community health centers. And Neil Kalman lives that to this day. And he said, let's do it. Let's see what we can do to improve population health. And here's the funny thing. He had an electronic health record. Back in 2005, they had been one of the first uh, community health centers in the country to implement electronic health record. They implemented Epic. At that time, a small company. Um, and they were able to do stuff like decision support, where and this was the graph that like, you know, we, we built this graph together and it changed my life. So this was a graph, and I apologize for not having slides, slight tangent. The first time I did a talk uh, on the federal government, uh, I think a few of you here will sympathize. The press people said, the public affairs folks said, so we need to clear your slides, put it through the political clearance process. I said, really? Well, what if I don't have slides? And I'm like, well, there's nothing to clear then. I was like, okay. <laughs> I don't have slides. So I haven't had slides since then. So this will tax your imagination. 
So you're going to have to imagine this with me, folks, all right? So here's uh, the y-axis was number of pneumonia vaccines, pneumovax given to patients over the age of 65. The x-axis is date. And they start off after they have their electronic health record and the tracking. Among, they had decided as a matter of policy for this community health center, every patient over the age of 65 who hasn't had a pneumovax should get a pneumovax. Fine. First month, they've given like five doses. They'd had hundreds of patients over the age of 65. They'd given five doses of pneumovax. Next month, eight. Next month, four. Next month, 12. Next month, 87. What happened? Decision support. They put a little you know, best practice alert that said, patient doesn't have evidence of a pneumovax in the record. Click here to order. Click here, right? Made it easy. And 87, the next month, 122, they ran out of vaccine doses, it dipped down, they got another shipment, right? And then they, did, they were doing pretty well. They were in the 60s, month after month after month, 10 times what they'd done before. And then what happens? Boop, back down to five. What happened then? Why did it go back down to five? System upgrade. <laughs> <laughs> Someone turned off the alert. The imperfectibility of man, right? And woman where it was a great natural experiment, right? For six months, they told docs, like, remember, pneumonia vaccines in the elderly, remember, right? We all believe this, right? There was no physician who said, oh, I choose to disregard the guideline because of my superior clinical knowledge. No, they just forgot. And when they stopped being reminded, put it back down to five, they turned the thing back on, put them back up to six. That was pretty cool. But then here's what happened. We noticed that in the two years since, there'd been these waves where every winter, the vaccines would go up, and then they would come down, and then they would go up again, and they would come down. But that's weird, because Numivax is not a seasonal thing. You give it you know, once every five, 10 years. Why, why, why was that? Why were these sinusoidal wintertime increases in Numivax? Boom! All right, so they had a workflow that said, Every time we give the flu shot, if they haven't had the new vaccine, give the new vaccine too, right? So that's the second phase, right, of how you make things that the right thing to do, the easy thing to do, how you change workflows, right? So not just having the thing flash before your eyes, but change workflows. And then here is the final thing, penultimate thing that I noticed about the chart. After four years of doing this, they were at 50%. They'd implemented the, so right, first they'd implemented the EHR and what had happened to quality? Nothing. Nothing had happened to quality. Hey, JG. Then they put in a best practice alert, decision support, <coughs> and then they got an increase. Then they put in workflows. Then they did all this stuff. And after four years, they were at 50%, coin flip. So this is what gave us both hope and it should give us more trepidation than it did, all right? And we said, aha, we're gonna use the electronic health record as a way to put Tom Frieden on the left shoulder of every primary care doctor in New York City. That was literally, that was the goal. I'm gonna tell you a little bit later about what happens when Tom Frieden stands over the left shoulder of a primary care doctor in New York City. <laughs> but here's the thing, what gave us hope was Here, having an electronic health record by itself didn't improve quality at all. But why did the graph start where it started? Because before that, we had no idea what was going on. So that was the aha moment, is that this infrastructure could be the necessary but not sufficient platform on which we could do population health. So we went out and we said, all right, Mayor Bloomberg, we want to save lives. And here's how we're going to do it. We're going to put an electronic health record. We actually said 1,000 docs on electronic health records, 2,000 e-prescribing, because that's an on-ramp. 
Turned out it wasn't much of an on ramp. We had to go eat crow, go back to the mayor. Sorry, mayor. It's not that easy. We'll, we're just going to do 2,000 docs with EHRs. That was our goal, we said. In the city's three poorest neighborhoods, worst health statistics, we're going to go to the small offices, onesie twosies that basically everyone at that time said, there is no way, right? Electronic health records, that's for Kaiser and the VA. It's for big institutions. This is big iron stuff, guys. That's not kid stuff. You can't put, you can't do this Kaiser stuff. You can't do this VA stuff in a small office practice. It's not practical. And we said, we're going to try. So we put out a bid. We got all the big HR vendors. Yes, Siemens was there too, JG. And we asked them questions like, you know, how do you collect smoking stats? Because you know, we want to count how many people smoke and how many of them have quit and how many, right? And what do they say? They said, sure, however you like. We said, uh, show us your decision support. And a very large, very large vendor, not Siemens, said, we don't believe in decision support. This is 2005, 2006. We don't believe in decision support, they said. What they meant was, our customers use this to document and bill. We don't see the value proposition for our customers of helping them improve quality. That's what it was. Another one showed us the work that we had done. <laughs> as evidence of how good they are at population health. And we chose one vendor, not because they were any good at population health. They had no clue what population health was, but they were interested in working with us. And they were small enough that we could meet with their CEO on Mondays and Fridays. Monday we would tell them what we wanted, Friday they would show us what they built that week. And we would iterate that for about a year. And we then rolled it down. 22 contacts per practice, average, average, not maximum. We did an average of 22 contacts per practice to get them into the program. We rolled it out, 233 goal lives, 232 successful goal lives. The one still bugs me. <laughs> and then we realized it took Tom to, and then now we had, right? We had quality measurement, the F11, Caroline Klein sees F11 key, right? You hit F11, and you see all the quality measures for the practice, fantastic. We had registry functions where you can make a list of the patients. We had decision support baked into it. And I went with Tom to a, one of our first docs, a storefront in, in Harlem, really nice doc. She was her and another part-time doc. And I said, so have you, have you seen the tab? Have you seen the population health tab? And she said, oh, no, I haven't seen that yet. I was like, okay, 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 okay. Here's what we're going to do. Of all your elderly patients, how many do you think you gave a flu shot to last, last year? And she said, oh, pretty good. All right, 80% maybe? So we said, all right, let's run the report, right? All the patients, and this is the, right? This is it. This is the denominator. This is the first time a primary care provider in the wild sees their denominator. <laughs> first time. Right? Ran the thing, whatever, 250 patients that you had seen in that time period during flu season where the vaccine was available. All right? Now, let's limit it to those who did not get the flu shot. Had she vaccinated 80%? 70? 60? 50? 40? 30? 22%. And what's the first thing that she says? First thing anyone says when they see their own quality. It is wrong. It's wrong. <laughs> right? And so here's the difference, though. When she got that report, it was not the first time that someone had told her. Right? It was the first time she owned the system. Because before, she would get a health plan report that said, you only vaccinated a mammogram, whatever. And what would happen to that report? Circular file, right? Because the data's wrong, right? But now she was able to double click on that and see a list of names, and then click on that name and see the chart. 
And then we went through about 10 patients where she said, oh yeah, well, she just came in for a med refill. Uh, yeah, I guess I didn't give her one either. We're working on her sugars. And then the next one, yeah, uh, I thought I gave her the flu shot. And then, the, and then after about eight or nine of these, she was like, ask the key question, right? She said, can I send him a letter? But here's the problem. That beautiful thing we built with the right pain where you see the patient here and you see all their quality measures here and you can with one click, not 15 clicks, with one click, you can say they had a mammogram outside or no, I don't need this or yes, order the mammogram. With one click, you can do all that. We had all these quality measures take care of New York built in, baked into the system. We killed ourselves, right? What do the docs do with the right pain? Nothing. They did nothing with it, <laughs> unless you came in and you did a lot of coaching. And even then, what do they do with it? Not much. Why? Why didn't the docs use that right pain? Hmm? The tyranny of the urgent. The tyranny of the urgent and the tyranny of something else, too. Pay me. Are you paying me for this? Because you know what, it takes extra time, right? And this is now the story about Tom Frieden standing over the left shoulder of a primary care doctor. So we're in the Bronx, we rolled it out, we go to visit this practice, and Tom, the, Tom says, to his credit, right, he wants to see this in real life, he says, can I, uh, can I go in with you to see this patient? And the doctor says, of course, they sign the HIPAA form or whatever, and the sweet lady, Dominican Republic, um, Tom's Spanish is actually pretty good, who would come in for a med refill. Because she's going back to the DR for a couple of months. She wants a 90-day script for her meds. And they go into the exam room. It's like five minute, 10 minute, right? So nine minutes, right? That's how long it usually takes. 10 minute goes by, 15, 20 minutes go by. The nurse bustles and bustles out. 25 minutes go by. She goes and grabs some, you know, the, I think it was a pap smear kit. <laughs> goes in, goes out, HIV testing. Goes in, goes out. 45 minutes later, Tom Frieden and that primary care provider, the primary care provider looked exhausted. <laughs> <laughs> Walks out of there. I imagine if Josh Sharfstein did that, it would be somewhat the same, right? Because, like, that's the right thing to do. This patient didn't have an HIV test. Right? And the prevalence was more than 1% in the community. She should have an HIV test. Right? She hadn't had a mammogram. She hadn't had a pap smear. She hadn't had all this stuff. Right? But she just wanted a med refill, and the doc got paid $29 from Medicaid for that visit. $29. So you can do that if Tom Frieden's standing with the left shoulder of the doctor. But you can't do that every day. You can't do that on every patient. You go broke. You literally go broke doing the right thing unless you work at the VA or Kaiser, where you can afford to do the right thing. So, global financial disaster, opportunity. And we said, okay, we're gonna do this and we're gonna call it basically meaningful use. We're gonna say all these EHRs have to have the ability to make a list of patients and collect smoking status in a standard way and blood pressure in a standard way and the medication so that you can say who has not had this. You have to be able to make a list of patients. You have to be able to measure quality. You have to be able to have decision support. Ah, we were so young and foolish, John. And we said, we're going to change payment so that it becomes profitable to keep people healthy and move away from this fee-for-service, do more, bill more. And we knew, day one, we need to be able to do both. But it was very clear that our goal was save a million heart attacks and strokes, right? So if you go back to the very first presentation on meaningful use in the Health IT Policy Committee, John had asked me and Paul Tang to co-lead that work group. 
and we put the first presentation together from Meaningful Use Workgroup in terms of what Meaningful Use of Health IT was going to do, and we said we start with the outcomes we seek. We seek to prevent a million heart attacks and strokes. This is four years before the Million Hearts campaign. We seek to reduce adverse drug events by 50%. We seek to have people's wishes respected, and so forth. Cut disparities in diabetes care. But having the tools doesn't mean you use the tools. Doesn't mean you have the right incentives. And so that's where we are today. That's kind of, for me, the next chapter is how do we help those same primary care docs who now have, I guess, in a compliance way, right? And I mean that facial expression, compliance. Right? In a compliance way, they have these certified systems that can do all this, but it still feels to them like check the box and get the check. Right? Unless we can have new payment models that say, if you actually keep the patient healthy and out of the hospital, the primary care providers can retain some of that value which they never have been able to do before. You did all the work, you created value. Who gets the value? The payer gets the value. The patient gets the value. The purchaser gets the value. But the primary care doc doesn't get any of that value. So the accountable care organizations, and what I'm doing at Brookings is very much working with physician-led accountable care organizations because I think they're the only ones in the system today that have aligned incentives with our public health goals. For the primary care doc, if they reduce an admission, a hospitalization, they keep the person healthy, they make more money. For a hospital-sponsored ACO, it's a little harder because they're standing on their own air pipe. Unless you're in Maryland where you get a waiver. It's a wonderful opportunity. But where I see this next phase of population health, public health and health care coming together is around these new payment models. Where you can say, and this is where I think in terms of a research agenda, what would be fantastic would be workable models where at a community level, if you can have a global cap on total spending, potentially even including social service spending, and if you can reduce that spending by keeping people healthy, however, whatever it takes. When we did our Beacon Communities, I told them, cheat, right? You have these goals, you got $15 million, 17 communities, you have these goals. I want you to cheat. I don't want you to only work with the healthcare system. You want to reduce asthma? Go work with the health department on housing issues or pest abatement, right? You want to reduce congestive heart failure admissions? Work with Meals on Wheels, cheat. You don't have to do everything through the healthcare system, right? But the problem that we have now is these silos of funding where you can't spend more on housing or Meals on Wheels and generate savings on the healthcare system and have that flow back to support those activities. Our vegan community in San Diego saved $8 million on 32 people, 32 human beings, $8 million in one year, right? Because they were able to give them you know, one person needed substance abuse counseling, one person needed meals on wheels, one person needed whatever. But we don't have a business architecture now for that concept of an accountable community. And frankly, public health doesn't even know what is it that we can do that will generate value and reduce healthcare spending. I'm gonna say that again. We don't know the answer to the question, what can public health do that will reduce healthcare spending in one, two, and three years. We do a lot of things that don't save money, and that's a good thing. Prevention may not save money in the short term. It may not save money ever. But there are some things, I believe, that we can do that can save money in this one, two, three year time frame and can provide powerful financial incentive for public health. So where are we? I think we're at a stage where we are going to see more pay for value. And the first step in this is an incredibly blunt instrument 
right? Which is quality measurement. Man, that's a blunt instrument, right? Any doc, I think maybe even Terry Cullen, who's you know half doc, half public health, will say, but that guideline that says like everyone's blood pressure should be less than one, like does that really make sense? Like what if it's an elderly patient who's already on 12 medications, they're gonna break their hip and, right? Like does that really make sense to simplify things so much in our population health rubric and create strong incentives around these blunt instruments around these quality measures, you know, the measures that matter, right? There was a fascinating talk on Medscape, everyone should watch this if you haven't already, between Eric Topol and Tom Farley, the outgoing commissioner of health in New York City. And they were wonderful doctors who talked completely past each other for an hour, right? It was around salt reduction, one of the things he talked about, and Eric Topol says, don't you agree that this is an absurd guideline that you want to reduce salt for everyone, whereas it's only 20% you know, of the population that's really salt sensitive, and most people can have all the salt they want? So don't you agree? Isn't it obvious that your population health guideline of everyone should reduce the salt intake is absolutely stupid? Right? And Tom Farley said, I don't even understand what you're saying. What's the harm in reducing salt? Right? He's like, I'm the doctor for a city. If we reduce salt in processed foods and restaurant whatever in the whole city, we will save X number of lives statistically. And Eratopel's like, that is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> right? Totally talking past each other. And I think what we need to move to the next phase of this is beyond the denominator, the all count denominator in our public health thinking and our quality measurement, and towards the best evidence for that individual. And the answer to population health is not, let's abandon evidence-based guidelines, right? It's let's make them better so that they are right for the right person. And what you cannot do if you have a you know, laminated sheet that says this is the guideline, you can't put in all those different 25 different subgroups, but you sure can if you have the data infrastructure and the data tools that we need to develop. So there's, most of healthcare today is absolutely random decisions, right? And we do about half the time what we should be doing. There's some increase in evidence-based guidelines which are blunt instruments. And where we need to go is not step back and step away from those evidence-based guidelines, but to make them better and better and more suited, more fit to the individual patient. So personalization, customization, the right therapy for the right person uh, is where I think we need to go. We can't keep in public health, we can't keep defending the ground of the blunt instrument of the evidence-based guideline for all patients, reduce their salt, improve their blood pressure. So that's why I would put the two things I would put on the agenda moving forward um, are those payment and how do we make our guidelines smarter and more personal. Thank you.